to uh, just to speak here from all of the different partners first, and then um, if you wish to ask questions, please do put them into the Q&A box and we will do all questions and answers at the end of the call. So just quickly before I begin, um, a little bit about uh, us. So the Connected Places Catapult, if you're not familiar with us already, uh, we are one of nine catapults part funded by Innovate UK across the country. Uh, and we're here to drive innovation uh, in our particular focus areas are areas such as the built environment, critical infrastructure and mobility, uh, particularly uh, looking to tackle key, key challenges set out um, by the industrial strategy uh, and the grand challenges such as um, meeting the net zero target for the UK. Um, so one of the ways that we do that is uh, we promote UK innovation and relationships between different parts of the ecosystem. So government, academia and, and industry and bring together different um, uh, buyers and suppliers and innovators to try and make uh, to drive innovation in these particular areas. So the NK5G is a brilliant example of that. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to our first speaker today, uh, Brian Matthews, the head of transport innovation at Milton Keynes Council, who's just going to give us a bit of background on the MK5G project um, and how it all came together. Okay, thank you, Alice. And, and thank you everybody for joining this morning. It's, it's really thrilling for us to get this far in the project and, and starting to work with, with people uh, around taking the capability we're building here in Milton Keynes forward. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, what what we, we are doing is, is working very much with our local enterprise partner uh, uh, through an initiative called the Local Growth Fund. Uh, this funding stream is, is allocated to support the, the two bullet points there on the screen about de delivering high value employment opportunities uh, and strengthening the this particularly air, area um, strengths in SEMLAP to take the local economy and growth forward. And very much the, the projects are funded if they also in, align to the national government's grand challenges, particularly on this call for funding on clean growth and the future of mobility. The project we have, we, we've decided to run very similar to an innovate type project. So when I go through the, the partners who are working with us, you, you remember that all of these companies are investing their own money into this alongside the, uh, the project funding from SEMLAP and the government. The total value that we've secured for this project is, is just shy of nine million pounds with a rough 50-50 split between public and private sector. So next slide, please. Um, and why we, we're looking at this in, uh, the, in, in the, the area is, is, is to really to support Milton Keynes and its growth into the future. Uh, Milton Keynes is a fairly successful economic hub in its own right. But as we move forward, we, we've, we've developed ambitious plans to double the size of the city to over half a million people in the next 20 to 30 years. That's a huge challenge to, to deliver, but it matches what we've done over time. So it's well within grasp of the city. But we've recognised to deliver that type of growth, we perhaps can't do things the same as we've done in previously. So we have to start looking at new technology, new ways of delivering successful, sustainable growth. Um, so next slide, please. So this is where the, the 5G capability came into our minds around is there something in this new communications, this new world of high tech that can help the, the, the city and the region move forward and deliver on the themes I mentioned at the opening? So what we have is pulled together a, a, a set of actually 10 partners. There's only nine shown on the slide, but Smart City was coordinating a lot of the work is unfortunately we, we, we left the, um, the logo off. So just briefly on what the partners are doing, Milton Keynes Council is, is taking the leadership role on this in, in setting the agenda and coordinating the delivery and really setting the challenges, uh, as I mentioned earlier, how to support how this technology can support the growth and development of a, a, a modern city. BT are providing uh, capabilities around developing the data hub, data uh, elements of the project, and we'll hear from Sandra in a moment around uh, the details of that. The satellite applications catapult are our architects and bringing their expertise into designing the, the, the capability and the network. Huawei are very much our infrastructure suppliers for the, the equipment. And it's perhaps worth stressing here that we, we 
probably all heard about issues with Huawei and security, et cetera. Uh, we're very uh, clear that what we're doing with Huawei is very much an, aligned to current government advice and guidance. So there is, there is no issues really in continuing to use their, their equipment. Uh, I think they've got a line, uh, ability to operate with, over the next five years, and we, we certainly that's probably the lifespan of our project. Smart Club are sorry, in, in the back. Smart Club are, are a partner who are, are looking at the energy use case, which we'll come on to in a bit more detail. The Open University are working alongside uh, BT to develop data capabilities. Tech Mahindra are our partners looking at security resilience, along with working with Smart Club on energy uh, um, uh, data uh, analysis. City Fibre are providing a uh, fibre network that the whole network connects into, and Connected Place of Catapult are supporting our uh, dissemination and acceleration and really engaging with businesses to, to use this capability into the future. So moving on to the next slides. This is a very basic uh, structure of what we're building in Milton Keynes and Kieran will, from the SAT apps will go through in more detail. But essentially we, we're deploying a set of base stations connected to a fibre network that covers around 60 to 70% of the city. This is brought back to a data exchange located in the city centre and links to a 5G core that's up and running down in Westcott, uh, which is just outside Aylesbury. And the partners, while we're in City Fiber, are, are really the, the infrastructure suppliers in, in that, uh, that, that scenario. So, next slide, please. The way the project is structured is the three key work streams, and we're going to hear from a couple of those in a moment, is around the, the actual architecture. How do you build a standalone 5G network in a city? So, uh, that's the work stream of the construction. The data exchange, again, detail to come, is, is led by BT, key work stream that's providing uh, the, 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 the data uh, exchange and utilization in a hub uh, created in Milton Keynes. And the area that I'm involved in in smart cities about the project coordination delivery uh, of, of the project. So next slide, please. Then in, in detail of what we're looking at is it's great that we build the, the infrastructure, but how are we going to use it? So we've developed three work streams, work packages around this. There are key challenges to Milton Keynes at the moment. This is not the only capability the 5G's got to uh, enable to support, but these are areas that we can concentrate on initially. So mobility, which is a, a work stream led by the council. Health use cases, how can you apply this technology to supporting health uh, development is led by the SAT apps. An energy use case around how we manage energy in, in cities is led by Tech Mahindra and Smart Club. And moving on, I'll very quickly cover what the, this means in terms of the uh, what we're looking at in the work streams or use cases. Is This is a very simplistic picture of Milton Keynes transport strategy. This is what we want to achieve in the future, more electric vehicles, more electric mass transit, greater sharing, uh, more autonomy and supporting activity. Uh, we haven't quite got the roadmap to get there yet, and, and we need to develop some uh, the uh, need to develop thinking to unravel how we get there. And 5G has probably got their role to play in get, getting to the, the end state that we were aiming for. Moving on. And this is just an example of some of the things that we're already doing in Milton Keynes. These are real pictures of real applications. So we're not standing from starting from a standing start in many of these areas. So we do have a lot of autonomy being trialed in the city. We are looking at managing grid networks for electric vehicles, developing sharing schemes, and really looking at how traffic management can be controlled in the future. So uh, we've got some experience in developing some very high profile highly technical use cases and moving on uh, and then in terms of the health and social care being led by these sat apps we're looking at specific use cases and, and initiatives around connecting ambulances better so you get an instant diagnosis on site how we would develop our monitoring systems particularly around early cancer diagnosis how we can develop telemedicine solutions how we can link it into some of the mobility solutions of how you can rationalize transport uh, services for the health service. 
and we were working potentially with drones and robotics to see how they can be applied. Uh, again, could it be telemedicine delivery through through autonomous systems? And moving on. And the energy is is really looking to how we can empower our data, uh, citizens and in fact businesses with data to support many of the aspects around uh, energy use around the city. Again, as we move to more and more uh, uh, issues around climate change, the efficient use of energy is very important to cities going forward, especially for the moving to more uh, electric type uh, applications of, of mobility. Uh, then moving on, just really to let uh, the, the group know where we are on the, this is that we started ju just about 12 months ago in the project and we've got to the stage now where we've started the, the construction of the base stations. I think two of our sites are completed, another two will be completed this month uh, and with a network uh, broadly complete by, by the end of November, early December. The 5G core is, is starting to come out of its, its base in Westcott, so that's all being connected. So we're very much on track with the original plan of delivering the, the network. Uh, we've worked through the COVID situation and, and come through relatively unscathed. So we, we may be looking to switch on the network towards the, the end of November, so we can start testing from that date with an expectation that we will uh, have the old tested and, and commissioned in the first quarter of 2021. So I think that's probably it from me as an introduction to the project. Thanks so much, Brian. And if, um, as, as I mentioned before, if we have any questions at all for any of the speakers, we'll, we'll do all of those at the end. Um, so I just want to introduce to you now, Kieran Arnold, who's the Director of Ubiquitous Connectivity at the Satellite Applications Catapult. So thank you very much, Alice. Um, like I say, Kieran Arnold, I head up our 5G activities from our Westcott Centre just outside of Aylesbury. Um, this forms part of the MK5G project and we, we provide all the architectural design, deployment and work with the rest of the partners in the organisation to deliver what is effectively uh, a coverage map and capability across the smart city. So if you jump to the next slide, please. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we're trying to achieve from uh, the, the smart city uh, and coverage on 5G, uh, really what we're looking for and, and uh, trying to explore is um, using 5G to drive new concept development. So in other words, things like AI, um, VR, um, or any of those immersive uh, media type applications that we know need low latency or high bandwidth applications as well. Really want to take existing products and move them down the evolution chain towards uh, exploiting 5G. And then in the latter two parts, you'll see there is, is to, to prove that the concepts and trials benefit from the use of 5G. And then finally, hopefully, if we can get commercial deployments um, on 5G and then start to exploit what we've already got in terms of a test bed within MK as a city, and then also working with some commercial uh, mobile network operators to try and get you on board and, and drive the um, commercial uh, rollout to, to mimic or at least d deliver what we're doing within the, the test bed, um, the city-based test bed within Milton Keynes. So, so next slide, please. Um, just, a, just a quick one here uh, for people who are probably not familiar, uh, what differs in 4G to 5G? Predominantly, I tend to say we're not really interested in connecting people anymore, but we're more interested in connecting things. And what 5G delivers is this um, communications framework or, or underpinning technology that drives these types of verticals. So in our case, as Brian explained, health, transport, uh, automotive, energy, those are the cons. And, and we can get the network to provide specific, um, I'd say SLA service level agreements that can do that uh, based on one common private 5G network infrastructure. Um, if you just click through the next two animations, um, 
that's fine. I'll explain a little bit about where 5G is coming from and where it's going to and, and why our testbed is, is different than, than what you might see in commercial deployments today. So the first um, uh, graphic you've seen there is shows 4G core network, 4G radio and 5G radio. This is referred to as non-standalone mode. Uh, and this is what you're seeing today from commercial operators. So the likes of London, Manchester, Leeds, etc. Those rollouts are based on your handset or your 5G handset talking first to a 4G network and explaining it's a 5G handset and then the network offering you a, co a connection to a 5G radio. Now, in the next generational move, that 4G doesn't need to be there. And we move to what is called standalone mode. And then that's just a pure 5G radio network talking to a 5G core network. And that's what we're deploying in Milton Keynes. There's some spectrum advantages to that. A, we don't need a 4G license and we don't need 4G spectrum to be able to do that. And it's less complicated in terms of deploying this than it is to do with non-standalone mode. The downside of that is our handset maturity is still um, being developed through the course of the next six to 12 months. So we've just started to see uh, 5G handsets uh, and devices becoming available uh, in uh, standalone mode at the moment. So things like the, the Samsung S20s, the, the Huawei P40s, um, the Apodo uh, devices, etc. So it's not that we will be shorter devices, but you need to understand not all devices in, in the first release will support standalone mode, or we might have to uh, advise you on how you will enable that standalone mode on your 5G handsets. So next slide, please. So just quickly um, in terms of coverage, because most people will be interested, as Brian said, we're covering um, almost 70% of the core areas around Milton Keynes. In the upper right there, that was our original intention to get overlapping coverage and try and use as much of the infrastructure you can to cover what we call were the critical areas within that. So central Milton Keynes, um, the road areas particularly we paid attention to in and around between the railway station and, and uh, central work areas in Milton Keynes and then moving out towards the distribution and M1 areas and also towards the Bletchley areas as well. So, so today I can, I can probably tell you we're successful in most of that. Um, the coverage map you'll see in the lower uh, left hand side there is what we call a clutter map. That, that gives us some uh, idea of um, building uh, height and size and whether we'll have coverage or reflection or um, loss of signal in that. So roughly in Milton Keynes, on average, you will expect to, to get a fairly strong signal. That means in terms of throughput, when we convert that through, not less than 300 megabits per second. Um, we can move up faster. We are working towards the gigabit uh, speeds in that, but that really depends on your handset. Most of the handsets we're seeing are running at about the four, five hundred megabits uh, uh, speeds. Um, so you should get a, a, a pretty good uh, throughput. I would say over at least ninety percent of the coverage areas we'll see uh, across uh, Central Milton Keynes. So, so next slide, please. Uh, this is, gives you an idea, Brian said we're already rolling out. We have three cell sites uh, in deployment now. Um, next week, we start to connect those cell sites to the core network over our gigabit links we've got between Milton Keynes and Westcott. And I'm hoping at least by the end of October, uh, we'll have finish the integration testing uh, ourselves and then towards mid to end of October, we'll start to put live users on the system. Um, this is actually the, the larger picture you'll see in there is the standard 5G deployment. This one has got our single antenna test antenna on at the moment. There'll be six antennas uh, on there at the end of the project. Um, covering, giving you a 360 degree coverage. And the smaller cabinet in, in that picture is actually the 5G cell itself. The larger cabinet is power and fiber optics that we cover. And you, and you can see within in this area, uh, the antenna, the lower right picture is the size of the antenna uh, and the simpler integration that you're starting to see now with 5G. Um, 
happy to take any questions at the end uh, in terms of architecture and how do we get on the network and, and what the process is or any technical questions on that. But um, I'll hand over now to our next speaker. Thanks, Kieran. Um, so our next speaker then is Sandra, Sandra Sinchich clark sorry, Sandra, um, from uh, BT. She's the IT Data Exchange Lead. Thank you, Alice. Uh, as Alice mentioned, my name is Sandra Sinchich clark uh, I work for BT Research and I run uh, IT data exchange activities. So if we can move to the next slide, I'll just give you a bit of a intro of what data exchange is. Uh, the MK5G installation uh, of the data exchange aims to be the place for all the partners, internal, externals, to provide and access any and all MK5G data in a uniform way. The reason for it is we wanted to lower barrier to participation and provide the infrastructure to enable scale for SME, SMEs such as yourselves to try out and develop new services. So if we can move to the next slide, Alice, please. What does the data exchange really do is gather the data. The data can come from a variety of sensors and sensor networks. Uh, they will generate data in different frequencies, different payloads, different sizes and so on. That data needs to be turned into usable information and that's where the data hubs, uh, data exchanges come to place. This approach has been tried and tested. We ran uh, a large quantity of collaborative projects over the past decade. We looked into supply chain solutions, into travel and transport. We worked on agri-tech. Amongst others, we worked on MK Smart project a few years back in, in Milton Keynes. So if we move to the next slide, please. What we want to uh, enable you is to find that data easy. So you can create apps or analytics that will provide something of real use from Milton Keynes, something that can provide you a chance to earn a share of profit at a later stage. Uh, so it's for us, it's just a browsable, searchable catalog of feeds, but that those feeds can be searched based on the name, location, data type. Uh, you know, if once you can find that data, you can start looking into it, consuming it. You will need to subscribe to it, uh, accept terms and conditions. And all that data is consistent. So all those things are easy and can be done within minutes. Uh, data is then exposed through a noticeable API. So no matter what the underlying data provider is, you still get the same payloads. It's simple web style requests. And, uh, you can choose what kind of format you want that data to be returned in. Um, do you want um, JSON, XML, CSV? I mean, if, even if you prefer something else, we're here to talk and to help you enable, create your solution. And uh, if you want to share your data, whether it's that data from sensors or is that something from post-processed uh, information, you know, all that is possible. It's a full ecosystem. You can easily create an endpoint, create your own data feed, push stuff into that feed. Uh, you can make it public, you can keep it private, you can choose that you want to share it with a certain uh, subset of users. We have provided code samples to make that journey a little bit easier. And uh, we even have node red samples if someone prefers that. Just you know, keep it as simple as possible. We want to enable you to try your innovation and not being bogged up with technical aspects of the infrastructure. Um, if you can move, thank you. <laughs> Data uh, in our world is structured as sensors, uh, events, and location. Uh, reason for it, most common data is sensor style data. It could be um, environmental sensors, it could be traffic sensors, it could be smart home devices that producing data. It could be something that we analyzed from a video and turned into numbers, uh, occupancy, usages, and so on. Uh, the list pretty much goes on. Uh, we you know, think of engineering, agri-tech, water, utilities, you know, sky's the limit. Uh, the second type of events 
is the data that has a location, a start, an end. It could be planned, like roadworks and football match schedules. It could be unplanned events, uh, like public health and safety alerts or road accidents. Uh, we try to wrap them and simplify them and push them out to you uh, in a usable format. Both of those events often need location to complete the context to make it work. So for that, we have location style data sets and they are pre-formatted so they can be easily included into maps or other types of apps. It goes from as examples here, bus stops, lampposts, cycle routes, and so on. Uh, in a gist, this is what data exchange is here for, but I will be happy to take any questions late, at the late stage of this call. Uh, I wanted to mention another thing that we are doing, and it's part of our schedule. Yeah, the next slide, please, Alice. Thank you. Uh, so the scheduler schedulers, or let's just call it simple scheduler because it's easier. Uh, from If we move to the next slide, it has three simple functions. Uh, first of all, it's a journey planner. And it, it's aiming to look at available forms of transport we have and select the ones that are the best based on user preferences or user requirements. It, it could be something like cost minimizing because the user has restricted mobility or it can include other factors like what is the current uh, or expected business at that moment, what is the weather forecast and so on. Uh, second use is making the best use of the resources that a company might have. So it might be that you want to schedule uh, your, well, your workers, so people with certain skill set, or it might be that you have a fleet of vehicles that uh, only certain vehicles have certain capabilities. So you have to make sure that all that is optimized uh, and to maximize your utilization, to maximize efficiencies. And the third part is actually a combination of the previous two. How to make all those resources available to others to do journey planning. So a um, simple exa example here would be a fleet of taxis. And if we can move to the next slide, Alice. So this is one of the very simple examples how this journey planner might work. So it all depends on the data that we come in, get into the data exchange. So it might include anonymous vehicles, it might include buses, uh, bus locations, taxis, and uh, their booking systems. Uh, it could include other forms of transport such as cycling or scooters. Uh, then the schedule will receive a request. So let's go back to that example where a citizen has limited mobility, but not excessively limited funds, so we can choose pretty much anything. And the system might conclude that the taxi journey is the best for that person. But if we had restrictions of finances and no restriction on the mobility, the system might suggest, okay, combined walking and a bus. So these are just a few samples. And as mentioned, happy to take the questions at the end or even get things offline for later if you if you think of something later. Back to you, Alice. Thank you, Sandra. So um, now we're going to move on to looking at the um, five-month accelerator program that we're running as part of this project. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Arnold Dutois from True Altitude. Uh, it's the Director of Corporate Development and he's going to talk through what the accelerator program itself is going to be offering. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Still, still good morning. And um, thank you so much, um, Sandra and Kieran and Alice so far. Um, thanks for everybody who's joined. We're from True Altitude. So True Altitude are a investment management um, and investment boutique firm based in London. Um, we operate across Europe with a bunch of LLPs, um, but we usually focus on investments uh, with B2B SaaS models, fintech, um, mobility, transport, and a few hardware um, solutions that we've worked on over the past five years. Um, I'm joined with my colleague, Martha, but um, I'll, I'll do the, the chatting away for the time being, so I'm sure she'll make some notes. Um, right, the uh, 
principle for us with running a program has always been um, cultivating companies that are almost good enough to start investing into. In this particular case, we'll be dealing with later stage businesses who want to test their technology and hopefully achieve something with a consortium partners, if not raise finance, which is exactly what we do for a living. So um, obviously the key um, focus areas, as you see in front of you, uh, mobility, um, health and well-being, uh, well-being low carbon energy um, and energy data. Um, for everybody who's on the call today, who sit within any of those kind of uh, areas of focus, you know, we welcome your applications or you know further questions at the end of the, the presentation. Um, next slide, please, Alice. So the program overview. Um, there, there'll be a host of different events that happen, but we operate a very bespoke style program, and we always have done because every company beats to a different rhythm. So um, there'll be uh, obviously a split between business support and technical support. Um, obviously, business support can be anything from getting your company ready to, to raise finance, um, you know, to, to make the most out of the test bed to either prove a certain touch point um, to a investor that you already know, or you might not know who the investor is, in which case our company can help you, you know, scout the right type at the right level at the right time, which obviously is super important. Um, but we are there to help your company scale and grow. So we'll be testing some of our theories that we run out with you through demo days. Um, we've got a few that we usually like to run, uh, a couple of practice sprints, but also because of the different consortium partners, we'll be um, trying to see if we can we can sort of align yourselves with the likes of people like Sandra at BT and all the other um, big companies who are supporting this program. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, the program details, I won't run through all of this because it's quite text heavy, um, but obviously uh, we, there'll, there'll be some one-on-one -on -one sessions. So you'll get a chance to meet most of our team, um, people like myself and Martha, and also our, our sort of senior management team at the fund who have, um, you know, the past 30 years of experience of scaling companies through, you know, anything from super seed series A, but now focusing more on sort of series B and C. So you're going to get a, a whole um, a list of our personal contacts and companies that we've invested into. Um, it's always fun to kind of go through our Rolodex and see if there's any kind of uh, alignment between the people that we've invested into in the past or companies that we work with and potentially your own. Um, so uh, mentors, uh, what, what we do at TA is we give this the chance to the SMEs that are chosen to go through the program to actually choose their own mentors. Um, there's no point forcing someone onto a company that um, doesn't quite have that same synergy. So we, we do a lot of, um, uh, I want to call it sort of, uh, there's a word for this, but anyway, we try and make sure that there's a bit of magic between the mentors and the SMEs, um, which makes it quite fun. Um, one of the kind of tailored approaches that we take. Obviously, I mentioned to you the bespoke program. Every company, you know, beats to a different rhythm. So we try and sort of match that rhythm, try and make sure that, you know, depending on what growth stage you're in, whether it's raising money, whether it's using the test bed to, you know, join slightly larger um, uh, ventures or, you know, partnerships with companies, collaborations. There's a, there's a whole plethora of, um, you know, obviously business models that we can, we can help you tailor. Um, trial demo days, like I mentioned, we'll practice um, everything we preach and we'll test and test and test again until it's absolutely pitch perfect. Um, and obviously the uh, um, uh, catch ups and touch points that we have, you know, go throughout different stages of the program. So next slide, please, Alice. Right. Uh, so a little bit more text. I'm sorry, you know, usually investment firms try to be a bit more creative, but um, we're trying to get as much detail for you out here so you, know, you can make the right decisions by joining this program. Hopefully everybody will. Um, but obviously, uh, um, you know, this is just a little bit more about the kind of bespoke uh, building of the, of the programs, the kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, investment readiness uh, scheduling usually do with all of our portfolio companies. Um, the sort of tailored approach that we take for every company that joins into this application format and whether we um, even consider ourselves as an investment firm to to take you through to investment, um, you know, that could always be an option. But we are actually here to support or either connect you to investors that are better suited um, if we don't fit the bill. Next slide, please, Alice. So uh, program support on the technical front, we've had um, a really good review, obviously, from Sandra and Kieran about the test bed and kind of how that would work. And um, from our point of view, technical um, support will match the business support. So what I mean by that is if you're trying to use the test bed to prove a certain use case of your technology to try and help you um, either 
prove a business model, um, you know, test a business model, uh, if not maybe even test partnerships with other companies on this test bed. We're there to help that technical and business side match well together. So, you know, bringing your CTO and your CEO and CFO together in a room so that they're speaking the same language, you know, everything's really well aligned. Our technical support um, uh, runs quite, quite wide throughout 5G, but also a lot of our other IoT um, companies. So lots of mentors there that we've got access to, whether you've got your own or, or whether we can find some that, that are best suited. That's part of what, what you get in the program. Um, yeah, we touched on investment support. That's pretty self-explanatory, depending on what phase your business is at, whether you're sort of, you know, early stage in, in terms of finance, but quite late in developing technology. There's obviously a whole bunch of different business models that you can take forward. Um, I think uh, the business development opportunities are pretty self-explanatory. There again, Alice. So next slide, please. Oh, that's that's you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I ran no through that so fast. Um, I realised how fast I spoke, and if that gives anybody back five minutes of their life, then you know. I hope... No, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to round off with just really following on from what you've said today, Arnold, um, on the accelerator side, in terms of some practicalities that we've um, put together. Um, certainly clicked ahead there but we're, we are actually here now um so just to kind of run through uh just so you know what it actually looks like in terms of time scales if you are thinking of applying the deadline for applications is uh next week uh, on friday um that we that is it's a kind of a tight deadline that one so we won't be able to extend so please do uh do aim to get to, to get it in by then and if you have any questions there's a uh, contact at the end you can get in touch with me or Arnold and just um, any kind of technical difficulties or anything that with the application happy to help we will be shortlisting next week um, on the on the 16th sorry of October and then we're running through uh, technical due diligence which I'll talk you through a bit more about in a minute um, which is going to be led by our um, technical leads at the Catapult and also uh, with some of our partners as well running through to a final assessment day on the 23rd of October that would be uh, an opportunity to if you're short shortlisted to pitch to uh, the consortium members um, that have been listed today um, and we will collectively make a decision about the 10 finalists for the accelerator program uh, and then we'll due to start on the 2nd of November with a demo day date of the 31st of March so that's what it looks like at the moment in terms of time frames. In terms of shortlisting and what that, you know, what we kind of score on, uh, so obviously it's important to know um, what what the kind of the ask is really. Uh, we do, as I said, we have a two stage um, selection process. So the first process we look at uh, really is technology and um, practicalities in terms of, you know, why are you looking to access the data hub and the test bed? Um, and what, what is it that you're looking to do, how scalable is your solution, how viable is your technology. Um, so we went through a kind of a, an assessment on um, initial assessment with you and we will also in, invite all sort of 15 shortlisted SMEs to the final assessment as well, which I mentioned is with the consortium partners and that's where we look at kind of more of a broad uh, broader scope across business really um, so kind of what how well do you fit with the challenges that have been listed what's your team like um, what's the kind of market that you're operating within and what the, what's the competitive landscape how much traction do you have so far um, you know what's the actual product and your business model and what's your what are your plans for um, investment and what's the, what do the finances look like so quite self-explanatory there really but those are the areas that we we look across um, when we are shortlisting for our accelerator programs and that is really largely it I mean to uh, just to kind of summarize our aims here um, this is about, you know, enabling SMEs to, uh, to, to, to connecting you with different opportunities. So commercial opportunities, one of the things that we do is to uh, introduce to potential customers across our accelerated programs. You would be joining a kind of family of accelerated programs, really, that Connected Places Catapult already, um, already has. So we have four other uh, accelerated programs at the moment, one of which being the Intelligent Mobility Program. We run in partnership with Wira, um, uh, Hyundai, Telefonica, and Frogo Services, where we've kind of over four cohorts now. Our SMEs have raised over 40 million. Um, they have achieved collectively 30 trials with commercial partners. Um, so, you know, these are the kind of, it's a, an alumni group and a sort of family that you'll be joining, really, where there are lots of wider opportunities. And our, our 
core aim here is to really help you to grow within the supply chain, um, as well as supporting you know larger companies to innovate and to access innovation. So that's really our um, what we're what we're looking to do overall. And as part of that, as Arnold mentioned, it's about looking at investment and commercial opportunities through our programs facilitating and promoting collaboration which is you know really one of the fundamental things that we exist to do um, and just providing that sector specific access to technical experts in the catapults and that would be you know across um, various catapult families in this case um, and just supporting with market readiness in general so that's a kind of overview of what we're looking to do today um, I'm going to move on to this is just again an overview of all the partners that are involved uh, with this project um, and if you would like to apply we'd encourage you to please visit the link here there's a QR code that will take you straight to it or you can see I will leave this up on the screen whilst we run through Q&A um, please apply by the 8th of October if you have any um, questions at all please drop us a line um, and we'll be happy to help and um, so I've got to see a few questions coming through now already, uh, which is great. So I'm going to, to start building those to the panel here today. Um, first question, I think, for Sandra, who owns the data in the data centre and how much is the subscription costs? Thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. So the data is always owned by the data provider. And uh, during the project, it costs nothing. Post projects, uh, every data provider can choose uh, how they want to expose their data sets. Uh, for the data sets that we are onboarding, uh, the consortium is negotiating with the data providers. So if you don't mind, uh, can I answer a question that uh, also mentions uh, other micro-mobility companies? So yeah. stay in line, Santander and so on, uh, are they participating or sharing data? So we are talking to them and we are trying to get the data from all or some of them onto the platform, uh, preferably for no cost for the participants of the program. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Question from Paul. Hi, Paul. Um, the timetable for application testing seems very tight. Uh, November 2020, 2020 to March 2020, 2021. How long will the infrastructure services be available after that? So just to be clear, the accelerator program is um, slightly separate. So that will be the uh, five month business support program that we're running alongside the test bed. Um, and I believe the test bed uh, is, um, I just want to pass to Kieran actually, because I have a couple of questions on the test bed, but about the, um, ability to access that if we just kind of uh, sense check that with you, Kieran. Well, it's Brian here. If I could just come in on the um, uh, one to Kieran Connects on the availability of the network, there's a commitment through the funding that we keep the network live for five years after we switch it on. So uh, okay. Network will be available for five years. Uh, probably in that time, it will be upgraded and developed, but that might require additional funding as well. But at least five years. Great, thanks, Brian. So I hadn't realised that um, Kieran had has had connection issues, so I will avoid <laughs> test that questions just for the minute until he reconnects. Um, so another question for um, oh no, that's one for Kieran. Okay. Um, so perhaps another one for you, Brian. Um, what exciting transport innovations are set to begin or are planned in the current coming year or two beyond what is currently in MK? And how excited are you by the prospects of better connected transportation? Well, taking the last point first, we, we, we're very excited about the, uh, the advent of connected uh, uh, integrated transport. It's at the core of the council's transport strategy as we see, this is, is the way forward. So you, the council is very much on board with this and wanting to explore its, its potential and benefits. So uh, you've got an open and willing council uh, that's listening and, and wanting to work with companies who are, are sharing amb our ambitions for this. In terms of uh, exciting innovative transport, well, we, we, uh, 
things happen quickly in Milton Keynes. We've just launched the largest uh, scooter trial, electric scooter trial that happened very quickly. Uh, it's tremendously successful. And we're starting to talk to the scooter companies now about potentially having autonomous scooters that can park themselves and get over some of the issues that we're finding in the trial. Um, we're working very much with micro mobility solutions. With uh, Starship robots are operating in the city. We can expand and, and develop the, those services and attract new new um, new players to that market working very much with other partners on drone technology, working with the connected places and sat out to catapult on, on those, those types of activities. Uh, and we've maintained the relationship with many of the autonomous vehicle providers we, we work with over the past several, several years, with, particularly with the UK Auto Drive uh, program. So we've got strong relationship with several OEMs, the pod manufacturers. So, so it's difficult to say anything very specific because this is a fast-paced, fast-moving area and we want to uh, work with, with companies that um, uh, obviously share our ambition. And it's also usually beneficial, I believe, to have the Connected Places Catapult based in Milton Keynes. So we, we have an excellent working relationship. So we're often in conversations around the new new things that are approaching and, and offering Milton Keynes up, up as an uh, urban laboratory test bed with this capability now is something very much welcome in the city. Great, thank you, Brian. I, I believe the, the next three questions I have are actually for Kieran. Um, and I think Kieran's, Kieran's with us. Yes, great. So um, the first one is, um, as satellite applications involvement, how is the 5G network related to satellite, any satellite applications being used? That's the first one. Yeah, no, by all means, happy to answer that. First of all, um, I think most people, when they, they talk about satellites, forget the, the three core elements to that. There's the communication side, there's the position, navigation and timing, or, or GPS, as most people know it as. And then there's also geospatial data. Um, obviously, from this project, we are using one of the elements, the SATCOM element is being used on the connected ambulance use case. Uh, and what we'll be testing there is uh, an ambulance from uh, central Milton Keynes moving through 5G network, how that improves the uh, remote and in transit diagnostics. And then out in the rural areas, we'll be testing um, satellite connectivity provider broadband type service to that ambulance as well. So, so that's most of what we're doing. Uh, we've got longer term ambitions to look at drone and drone capability and what we call beyond visual line of sight. We'll be using satellite connectivity uh, embedded with a 5G and 4G capability as well. Thank you. And the next question from Jeffrey um, is asking, um, you know, it, it, unless the innovator is a data consumer, where are the opportunities for integration hub vendors um, uh, in, in terms of the MK5G data exchange? Um, it, uh, you know, if 5G is simply a big, bigger data pipe with a ubiquitous presence compared to what's come before, um, is that, have we lost Kieran? No, I'm um, still there. There. Sorry. Alessandra here. I think this is more of a question for me, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so in a way, data exchange already reaches out to some of the other uh, current and historic data sets uh, hub providers. So Jeffrey, if we could take this offline and see is there an opportunity to link up or just open a conversation to see. I'm not really sure well, what data uh, do you have your hosting and what are the opportunities to link up? So I can't open, uh, I can't answer more than this, sorry. If, um, if Jeffrey, if you um, contact us on the email addresses there, we'll connect you if that's all right, Sandra, after the call. Yeah, that's absolutely um, fine. Great, uh, another question from Lawrence. Um, so 5G aims to support huge members edge devices in the massive machine type communications corner of the triangle, but it does not currently lend itself to low cost sensors with a long battery life. Um, so do we have a way for um, the, the, there's a whole host of technical, <laughs> LoRaWAN, Sigfox, BLE tech traffic to take part? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's no reason why we couldn't uh, integrate LoRaWAN. Obviously, we haven't included that in the network architecture. We're really 
predominantly focused on on what 5G delivers. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm curious on why you don't think 5G would be more power efficient than than 4G or, or LoRaWAN, where you know there are specifications um, within 3GPP that look at power and long-term sustainability, things like narrowband IoT and things like that, which which we would be able to use on on the test bed as well. Um, so yes, uh, there's, there's no plan to interconnect uh, a LoRaWAN gateways, although technically it's not difficult to do that if we, we had access to one anyway. Um, certainly would like to explore networks of networks, as we call it. It's not all about 5G, but equally about making sure we've got a communications framework that supports all of those smart devices or, or smart infrastructure. Okay, and is it possible to test 5G capabilities related to the quality of service guarantee, specifically with network slicing on the network? Uh, I pose the question back is, what is it you're trying to prove on network slicing? This is a private 5G network, uh, and there is questions whether network slicing on on a private 5G network, you gain any benefits at all, because you know, we haven't got a huge amount of subscribers on this. So the so quality of service can be natively delivered off 5G anyway, without actually imposing network slicing. Um, so. It, it, whoever posed that question, we were probably a, a little bit more of a technical uh, conversation needed to understand what is it you want to test um, in terms of quality of service and whether network slicing is the right thing for you. So again, Kusha, if you want to um, take that offline, I know we're connected over email already, um, and then we can kind of continue that conversation afterwards. Um, so the last question, I think, unless anyone has any more, um, from Paul Tanner. So we, we plan to convert an existing LoRaWAN mo mobile health application to work with MB IoT, carry out a trial to see if that will improve usability. So would you regard that as relevant in the context of the MK5G programme? Uh, yes, we can support narrowband IoT on our 5G network. Great. That was an easy one to answer. So... Uh, I think that's all, unless there are any other questions. I can't see any coming through at the moment. Um, but as mentioned, if you do 